in some of the messages the prosecution admitted, you say that you failed as a parent. Do you feel, are you a failure as a parent? I don't think I'm a failure as a parent, but at that time, um, I guess I didn't see, I felt bad that Ethan was sad at those things, and I guess I just, I don't know, I just felt like I failed somewhere. I don't, I don't really know how to describe it. At that point in time, I just, I just kind of felt like somewhere I failed. Do you believe there was anything, um, do you believe that you knew or had reason to know your son was a danger to anyone else? No. Um, as a parent, you spend your whole your whole life trying to protect your ch your child from other dangers. Um, you never you never would think you have to protect your child from harming somebody else. That's what that's what blew my mind. I was just that, that was the hardest thing I had to to stomach is that my child har harmed and killed other people. Do you believe there were things you were thinking at the time, I should do this, but I'm not doing it? Do you look back and think that? No, I don't. I mean, I of course I look back after this all happened, and um, I've asked myself if I would have done anything differently, and I wouldn't have. If you could change what happened, would you? Oh, absolutely. I wish he would have killed us instead. Uh, Jane Jennifer Crumbly testifying that her son never asked her to get any help for his mental health issues. Well, here are the facts. The jury has seen texts that he sent to his little friend, journal entries saying, I need mental help. I've asked my parents, they won't help me. There's no evidence the parents saw those texts or the journal entries, but she was asked that question. Here's how she responded. Did you ever believe that your son needed mental health treatment, therapy, counseling, anything? No, I mean, there was a couple of times where Ethan had expressed anxiety over taking tests, um, anxiety about what he was going to do after high school, whether it was college, uh, military. So he expressed those those concerns to me, um, but not not to a level where I felt he needed to go see a psychiatrist or a mental health professional right away. No. Now this is interesting because once he was arrested. Ethan was given a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and he told them in sessions that he actually lied in those texts, that he hadn't asked his parents for help. But that did not come before the jury because they are privileged medical records of Ethan Crumbly's. He did not waive that privilege. How did the mother describe the meeting with school officials that happened, as people might remember, the morning before the school shooting happened? Well, remember that morning, she had been sent a, a mass sheet where he had bullets and blood and my life is worthless and the world is dead. And he, she was asked to go to the school immediately. She texted her husband, emergency, we have to go to the school. So they went there and let her describe in this testimony what that meeting was like. It was pretty nonchalant. It was pretty brief. Um, he told us that he didn't feel um, that my son was a risk and actually gave him the option um, if he wanted to stay at school or go home. My son wanted to stay at school. So we all discussed, we all discussed that. So that he did say he wanted mental health treatment for their child. And she said that he hurt his testimony is she said, I got to get back to work but would do it within 48 hours. But his testimony sort of reflected that he didn't want to pull him out of school. It was their decision. Ethan wanted to go back into class. And so he was given his backpack and he went back into class. And then a couple hours later, the backpack had the gun. And, and Jean, about that gun, what, did, did she testify how it was or was not locked away? Well, she said that she wasn't there when it was purchased the day after Thanksgiving, that she wasn't really into guns. She was more into horses, so her husband helped the gun and hid the gun, so she didn't really know where it was. Uh, we do know that on the day of the shooting, husband went home. Afterwards, there was the gun case open on their bed in the master bedroom, and the gun was missing, and that's when he called police and he turned in his son. All right. Gene Casares, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Let's bring in now attorney and legal commentator Ariva Martin. Ariva, what did you make of Jennifer Crumbly's testimony today? D did it help her or did it hurt her, do you think? 
Well, Jake, her attorney said in opening statement that she would take the witness stand and testify, and she did that today. She had a lot to explain because those text messages, many of the text messages that we now have learned about in this trial, many of them were very troubling, like the text message about him hallucinating and uh, believing that people were in his home, uh, and the text messages about him trying to seek or asking his parents for help with uh, some kind of mental health counselor and his mom laughing at him. So Jennifer spent the morning really trying to explain, one, how she either didn't know that her son needed mental health and, as it relates to that hallucinating, that they had a game that they played because this was a 100-year-old house uh, and they often kidded around about there being ghosts in the home. So I think a lot of what she said helped her, but there still were big gaping holes. Obviously, prosecutors are going to try to pick apart her testimony. Was there any part of her testimony in particular that you think might be vulnerable to that? I think with respect to the time she spent with horses, one of the big issues in this case is that she was pretty much a negligent mom that didn't pay attention to her son and beyond negligent that she was grossly negligent, that her son was crying out for help. And rather than give him that help, she was spending time with her horses. And what we learned earlier was with a boyfriend that she was having an extramarital affair with. So I think the prosecutors are going to really go after her hard to try to establish that she was, in fact, ignoring her son who was lonely and who had some clear emotional health issues, but she was too busy uh, spending time at a stable and taking care of horses. Uh, And because of that, she didn't notice what was happening with her son. Obviously, this trial is being watched by individuals who who want to hold parents accountable uh, when there is negligence uh, for crimes, especially mass shootings committed by their children. How, How important is this trial for that cause? This is a historic trial, Jake, because in this country, in our jurisprudence system, parents aren't normally held criminally responsible for the intentional acts of their children. So if there is a conviction of Jennifer or later her husband, uh, it is going to be a a precedential setting case. Uh, And I think folks want to hold a lot of people responsible for these mass shootings, not just parents, but also school districts, as well as gun manufacturers and others, because there is amongst... uh, belief amongst many of us there are too many guns in this society and kids have access to them in a way that is creating these very dangerous situations for schools. Ariva Martin, thanks so much. Let's bring in CNN contributor Stephen Gatowski. He is founder and editor of The Reload. Um, Stephen, good to see you. What do you make of Jennifer Crumbly on trial? Uh, just the, the fact itself that she's on trial for involuntary manslaughter because of the deadly mass shooting that her son committed. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a very novel case. I mean, I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like this where uh, a parent is on trial for murders that their their child committed purely based on uh, not doing enough to intervene. Although the facts of this case are also very unique, especially that meeting they had the morning of the shooting and then the dire warnings that were uh, you know, brought across during that. Yeah. Um, and not to mention the, the gun uh, and, and how he got it. Um, mm-hmm. do, you, do you think this trial will be a catalyst for other parents being held legally accountable for, for mass shootings committed by their children? It could be if, there, if the circumstances are this severe, you know, where, where there was this much uh, negligence. I mean, it, it's, a, it's certainly a hard thing to hold a parent responsible for the deliberate act, criminal acts of their, their children uh, in this way, um, and, and you know, being irresponsible with how you store a gun is, is certainly something that's uh, very bad. And I think most respe- responsible gun owners would be uh, outraged by the situation here, um, especially you know th- this idea that she didn't really have any responsibility. It was the husband's responsibility. It may not, but that might be a fairly common view, but it's not a very good one uh, when you have a gun in the home and you have children who can have access to it. But, uh, you know, I, I think commonly the, the view is that, you know, safe storage laws are, are trying to hold somebody re- responsible for horrible acts like this after the fact that a parent um, won't work necessarily. People who are responsible are going to be responsible. And uh, it's not clear that those who aren't already in that mind frame are going to be have their minds changed by something like this.